Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, not fake news. The health of our democracy is in the ICU. That's what the results of a new poll show, according to its director. The outcry for gun reform is far from over. Today was the deadline to file petitions to be a candidate for Congress. We'll see who's running. Plus, the Red Bull Arena is going green. The soccer club swapping trash for treasure from the power grid. And you can think of it as April Fool's Day, one day late. Winter's not done with us yet, not by a long shot. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Bad news about fake news. A new poll shows a majority of Americans now believe traditional media outlets either slant or fabricate their stories. If the fourth estate is suspect, is democracy itself in trouble? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Just this morning, Donald Trump tweeted, so funny to watch fake news networks among the most dishonest groups of people I have ever dealt with. That kind of characterization by the president helps explain a new Monmouth University poll that shows 77 percent of people surveyed believe the mainstream media disseminates fake news at least occasionally, and 42 percent think they do it in order to push an agenda. Those numbers alarm Director Patrick Murray. I think it's very dangerous. I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, the cornerstone of a healthy democracy is a public confidence in an independent fourth estate, an independent media. And right now, that confidence is so low that uh, we have to say that the health of our democracy is probably in the intensive care unit right now. The poll indicates 65 percent of people believe the term fake news doesn't just apply to errors, but also to how news outlets decide what to report. Murray says that comes straight from Trump and tweets like, any negative polls are fake news, just like the CNN, ABC, NBC polls in the election, or Trump's response to CNN at a news conference last year. Don't question, be you're rude. You're attacking us. Thank can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you no, give I'm us a question? A I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. It's not just false stories or stories with uh, inaccurate pieces of information in them. Uh, it's also the, the idea that uh, a certain news outlet might have an editorial bias that uh, presents information in a way that you don't particularly like. Uh, that's what the president has been doing recently, and I think that's been trickling down. News executives also point to the pro-Trump Sinclair Broadcast Group allegedly instructing its news anchors to read from this same script. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. Today, Trump tweeted, Sinclair is far superior to CNN and even more fake NBC, which is a total joke. The strategy, I think, of folks who are trying to promote this idea of fake news is they're trying to undermine faith in uh, the media. Uh, and that's really dangerous. And this constant questioning of fake news is, is not good. On the other hand, you know, the media has a responsibility as well. Republican strategist Roger Bodman says Trump may not stop tweeting, but the news media bears some of the blame for public mistrust. We had issues with Dan Rather. We had issues with Brian Williams and other notables in the mainstream media that caused people to pause. You know, yes, the president created the phrase fake news, but credibility, in my view, and at least in certain cases of regard to the mainstream media, predated that time. One last Monmouth poll item. More Americans say they trust cable news than the president as a source of information, except for Republicans who say they believe Donald Trump more than MSNBC, CNN, or even Fox. In the newsroom, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Gun violence makes news and triggers gun safety rallies. 
when it causes mass casualties at a school, but in our inner cities where the casualties happen one victim at a time, rallies are rare. Brianna Venezzi reports on one held today. For me, this pain never goes away. In the battle over gun reform, moms like Regina Thompson Jenkins are hoping to shift the conversation to something much larger, the violence that happens every day on inner city streets, the kind that took the life of her son in 2012 in the capital city of Trenton. I'm just one mother. Um, there's many in the city who are, whose voice are voiceless. But I just choose to speak out because my 19-year-old was taken from me, and he was my only child. She joined a few dozen others in the raw, wet weather for a gun safety rally outside the state house today, hoping to keep the pressure on lawmakers now that the issue is gaining new momentum and a larger platform in the wake of mass school shootings. See, the kids in Parkland, Florida are demanding change after they've experienced something that urban communities go through every single day. Yes. 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 Trenton Central High School senior Brianna Martinez Jimenez is hoping will become a national model. The state has some of the strictest gun laws on the books and it's helped reduce domestic violence crimes and homicides. Yet she says people pay more attention when the gun violence happens in schools. Enough enough. Enough, enough. It doesn't just happen in places of privilege but it also happens mostly in urban communities um, and nothing is really done about it. Right now, lawmakers are moving a six-bill gun reform package through the legislature, though some critics say it does more to crack down on those who are already following the law and not enough for those who aren't. In a statement, the New Jersey Second Amendment Society said we're dumbfounded by the fact that the New Jersey legislature believes criminal behavior and what happened at Parkland is due to a lack of laws. This national, quote, movement is nothing more than terribly misguided children being exploited by those with an agenda to ban guns. We're trying to work with gun owners because they, they're, in, they're in, integral to this conversation. You know, we want to respect their rights while making it safer for people in America. Moms Demand Action organizer Reba Holly calls this bill package a baby step. Among other things, it limits magazine capacities, types of ammunition, and increases background checks. Some of these rules are already in place at a federal level, and she acknowledges just one out of the 96 people killed by guns daily is from an assault rifle. We're working toward getting basic laws in place so that later we can address other things. Still, she says you can't bring change or more safety measures without starting somewhere. In Trenton, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Amazon prospects on a turbulent day. That tops today's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, Amazon is making headlines today and having a big impact on Wall Street. Representatives from the company have reportedly now visited half of the cities in contention for Amazon's new headquarters. The Wall Street Journal says during the visits, Amazon is requesting local officials provide analysis of their city's education and talent, as well as in-person visits of several potential sites. Newark, of course, on Amazon's short list of 20 potential cities and is offering $7 billion in state and local tax credits to try to lure the e-commerce company. Meantime, stock of Amazon retreated again after President Trump continued to criticize the company over taxes and its payments to the U.S. Post Office for delivery service. That was one of the contributing factors to a big Wall Street sell-off today. Stocks were also under pressure on worries of a trade war with China after China did follow through with its promise of retaliatory tariffs against the U.S. The Dow fell more than 450 points and the Nasdaq slid nearly 200. In Atlantic City, the former Revel Casino will reopen this summer as the Ocean Resort Casino, and it will be affiliated with the Hyatt Hotel chain. That's according to the Associated Press. Ocean Resort is one of two new casinos set to open in the next few months. The other, the former Trump Taj Mahal, which has been taken over by the Hard Rock chain. A fantasy sports company, DraftKings, has been contacting potential casino partners in Atlantic City looking to offer sports betting if the U.S. Supreme Court legalizes it. A ruling on that could come as early as next week. The AP says DraftKings recently opened an office in Hoboken. If you use a Lord & Taylor or Saks Fifth Avenue credit card, your account may have been hacked. 
The parent company of those chains, Hudson Bay, says its store payment systems were hacked and data from about 5 million customers may have been compromised. This is being called one of the largest data breaches to hit retail. The hackers began stealing information last May from people who shopped in 130 stores, mostly in New Jersey and New York. And those are our top business stories. Another pushback on a travel ban. New Jersey's entered the multi-state court battle against President Trump's third proposed ban on travelers from six Muslim-majority countries, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, and Chad, along with North Korean nationals and some government officials from Venezuela. The state attorney generals joined an amicus brief in support of a lawsuit filed by the state of Hawaii challenging Trump's executive order, Gerbeer Graywall arguing that in addition to being unconstitutional, the travel ban has done incalculable economic harm to business, higher education, medicine, research, academic study, and tourism. The Supreme Court is set to hear oral arguments at the end of the month. Today's the filing deadline for Democratic and Republican candidates who want to run in the primary election June 5th. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron looks at the congressional races shaping up as game changers. In the House of Representatives, New Jersey has 12 seats. Six of them look safe for the Democratic incumbents, Donald Norcross, Frank Pallone, Albio Ceres, Bill Pascrell, Donald Payne Jr., and Bonnie Watson Coleman. Six others could change hands in November, including all five Republican-held seats. Today was the filing deadline, so we know who is definitely running. Frank Lobiondo in District 2 is retiring. Democrat Jeff Van Drew and two others are running in the June primary. Wealthy engineer Hirsch Singh, former Assemblyman Sam Fiocchi, and three other Republicans have filed. Republican Rodney Freelingheisen is retiring in District 11. Democrats Mikey Sherrill and Tamara Harris are competing in the primary. Republican Assemblyman Jay Weber and Totowa banker Anthony Gee are vying for the GOP slot. Weber is well known. Gee says Weber is too conservative. Veteran journalist Nick Acacella says those two open seats are the likeliest to go to the opposite party. And they are probably most ripe for the picking by Democrats. Um, Democrats might have won those seats even if the incumbents had run, maybe part of the reason they got out. In District 7, Republican Leonard Lance faces a serious challenge in November. Former State Department official Tom Malinowski, Peter Jacob, who ran against Lance the last two times, and Gudum Joyce are the Democratic primary contestants. Next most vulnerable is probably Republican Tom MacArthur. Former White House official Andy Kim is the lone Democrat. Acachella believes the incumbent has that one. I think that's the least likely one to fail because it's, it's in both the New York and the Philadelphia media markets. So any media buy you do is very, very, very expensive. And MacArthur is a wealthy man. Congressman Chris Smith will be the hardest Republican to topple. Democrats Joshua Welley and Jim Keedy filed for the primary. That's as safe as anything can be. The problem is we're expecting a wave. If it's a 20-seat wave going for the Democrats, then Smith is perfectly fine and MacArthur is perfectly fine. If it's a 60-seat wave, as some people are saying, uh, all bets are off. The only Democratic incumbent who could face a strong challenge in the fall is Josh Gottheimer in District 5, perennial candidate Steve Lonigan, and lawyer John McCann seen here filing his petitions today are fighting for the Republican nomination. My guess is Josh is Gottheimer's relatively safe. Uh, the Republicans are engaged in a bloody primary. Uh, nobody really knows who's going to emerge out of that. And in a, in a, in a blue wave year, uh, a marginal Democrat is safer than he would be, especially running for a second term. Second term is when you try to knock these guys out. The Division of Elections says 33 people were in line at 3 p.m. this afternoon in Trenton filing petitions. The primary is June 5th. In Newark, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News.
Marking a milestone in the civil rights movement, that tops tonight's Garden State Express, our first stop, Buena Vista Township, where an exhibit marks half a century since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King on a hotel balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. The African American Heritage Museum of Southern New Jersey was founded by Ralph Hunter, who was on the Washington Mall when Dr. King proclaimed, I have a dream. He's displaying the original information packet and program for the 1963 March on Washington, along with magazines, books, statues, record albums, paintings, prints, and photographs documenting Dr. King's work and the civil rights movement, including a letter from Atlantic City attorney James Cooper, who defended people charged with crimes for attending King's 1965 march in Selma that led to the passage of landmark civil rights laws. Next to Dunn Ellen, marking an athletic milestone, former Union Catholic star and 2016 Olympic qualifier Sydney McLaughlin made her spring track debut for the University of Kentucky by recording the third fastest 400 meter time in NCAA history. She set a new collegiate freshman record, running a world leading 50. 0.07 in steady rain at the Florida Relays in Gainesville. As a junior in high school, McLaughlin was youngest track athlete to compete for Team USA in four decades. Her collegiate openers and early sign her speed is at an all-time high. Finally, Millville celebrating another athletic benchmark. Hometown hero and Angels outfielder Mike Trout is poised to become the highest paid player in Major League Baseball. The Associated Press projects the Millville Meteor will earn an inch over $34 million this season, including a share of his signing bonus. The New York Yankees? Well, their home opener took a snow day, but when their season does open, the Bombers' payroll is on track to be baseball's seventh highest payroll, their lowest since 1992. And that's a Garden State Express for Monday, April 2nd. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. the only men's professional soccer club in New Jersey power up its game by taking out the trash. Michael Hill explains. Red Phillips taps it in. Red Bull Arena, home to Major League Soccer's New York Red Bulls, has gone green. Very important for us to be great community partners. So we want to be green. The energy that runs through these lines and powers this equipment and everything else at Red Bull Arena comes from household and other non-construction waste processed at Covanta's Newark facility about a mile away. All of this waste is, is brought to our facility. It's burned to make uh, steam. That steam is converted into electricity. And then transmitted to Red Bull Arena. Covanta says it costs about the same as traditionally sourced energy, but with some major environmental advantages. One of the benefits here is that a lot of other power plants are, are powered by fossil fuels, and those fossil fuels emit a lot of greenhouse gases. Our facilities have two benefits. First off, they're not uh, carbon based, they're not fossil fuel based, they're renewable energy, base load renewable energy. And then also, the trash doesn't make it to landfills. If it were to make it to those landfills, the methane would be 30 times worse as a greenhouse gas constituent. So there's two benefits and savings from our base load renewable energy uh, power plants. Red Bull Arena has installed bins to recycle waste that fans generate in this 25,000 seat stadium. Waste that eventually will go to Covanta's power plant and come back one day as energy. They could be part of that as well by going to the recycle bins, using the recycle bins, making sure that we're getting rid of our trash in the proper way to bring a brighter future for this planet. We're, we're proud. We're so proud to be part of this. People are very responsive to this. I think people want to do this and when, they, when they're at a sporting event and they do this at the, at the sporting event, they'll look out and search out to see what they could do more within their community, with their homes and businesses. Red Bull Arena says this has a lot to do with looking out for the planet. 
we're doing our small part and also should be noted it's not just Red Bull Arena but it's also our training facility in East Hanover is also powered by Covanta so the two buildings that we operate are run by Covanta in terms of energy which is which is great so it's double the message. Covanta says the energy from waste shift shrinks Red Bull Arena's carbon footprint equal to taking 1800 cars off the road. In Harrison, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Quick six inches or so of snow had the entire state wearing white after Easter, but this was not the snowiest winter in New Jersey history. Numbers issued by the New Jersey state climatologist David Robinson indicate from October through March, snowfall in New Jersey measured 37.4 inches, which pales in comparison to the record 62.8 inches that fell in the winter of 1995-96. And the state records date back to 1895. But today's spring storm still had an impact. Leah Mishkin reports. I got here from Portugal yesterday. A flight out of Newark Airport was $1,000. So Tom Laughlin bought a train ticket to get to Austin, Texas. It's a 50 hour train ride, so hopefully the snow doesn't you know, run us too late. Plane or train, that'd be a good uh, race to like, see who'd get there first. I wasn't expecting this when I woke up. This is, this is lovely. Yes, it's April, but the snow keeps on coming. As of 7 a.m., state police had responded to about 50 motor vehicle crashes or requests for aid. Some districts announced school delayed openings and closures. And people in areas like Morris County woke up to more than seven inches. I'm thinking that this is Mother's Nature's way of reminding me why I left in the first place. <laughs> New Jersey native Dana Marion is visiting from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where she's a travel agent. The four nor'easters we had last month definitely kept her busy. I think this is the most I've ever seen, yes, because we've had to reroute a lot of passengers this year and a lot of cancellations happened. She was at Newark Penn Station with her family. They were on the way to the Museum of Natural History. Although the dinosaurs aren't the only thing her children were excited to see. I've seen snow once in South Carolina, but that's about it. So this is just like a new thing. It's what like do you think of it? I like it. Thank Are you. you delayed as far as you know? No, I, we just were trying to figure out the tickets and stuff like that. So we were over there asking. So now we know we got to go over to the path side and get tickets over there to get over there. All right. Enjoy the snow. I will. Enjoy the dinosaurs. Even some people we met from New Jersey had high spirits this morning as the snow slowed down. Oh, I love snow. I think it's really beautiful. So. <laughs> Morgan, do you like the snow? Yes. This Dallas flight made it in on time. Morgan showed me her chapstick collection as she waited for her bags. Oh, that smells so good. This is my favorite kind of Starburst. Let's smell it. I know. As of 1 o'clock, fewer than 100 flights had been canceled at Newark Airport, but nearly 400 flights had been delayed due to snow and ice. Uh, we have a two-hour delay right now, so we're just going to hang out in the airport. This family says they are ready to get to Fort Lauderdale. There was a lot of snow in our house today. So we had to clean the cars. Hopefully this is the last snow of the year. Our friends from across the pond had just landed from Heathrow Airport and were making their way to their connecting flight. Did you just point to Orlando, if I saw correctly? That's yeah. where we're going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not bad, you're getting out. No, I'm glad we're getting out, actually, because when we come in, we were like, oh, no. <laughs> and a lot of people on our plane were like, oh, we're staying in New York. But they weren't concerned about the weather affecting their trip. Everything Shut down. shuts down and stops in England when there's snow, but we knew you'd be all, it'd be all right over here. So yeah, you had faith in the Americans. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> the good news: it's unlikely there will be more snow for the next few days. The bad: meteorologists say a storm Friday night and Saturday has the chance of bringing more April snow showers. But if you're feeling down, just remember this guy, who still has 44 hours on the train in Newark, Leia, Michigan. NJTV News. And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Five of the 12 congressional races in New Jersey are considered competitive, according to a Cook Political Report analysis. The last significant snowstorm to hit New Jersey this time of year was the April Fool's Day blizzard of 1997. Revel Casino Hotel opened on April 2nd, 2012, six years ago today. It closed in 2014. And the number of television stations owned by the Sinclair Broadcast Group in New Jersey is zero. 
If there's someone you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, the state budget gets a hearing on a college campus and a half century of educating students of color to become activists for social justice. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing. Business leaders. The caretakers of our historic landmarks and the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. Together, we're beating cancer. Together, we're unlocking the mysteries of the brain. Together, we're changing the way healthcare is provided, delivered, and imagined. Welcome to RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey's most comprehensive health care system with 41,000 medical professionals serving millions of people throughout New Jersey. So when it comes to your health and wellness, you're never alone. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.